some of my colleagues say, I've never met a slide I don't like, and you're going to see that. Um, so what, this is an extremely exciting time for computational science and engineering and data science. Um, and so I chose to talk less about plans and how we're organized and, and try to dive into results that really excite me. Um, with that, I had to guess on what you might want to see and what you might not want to see. So um, forgive me in advance if I miss something that, you, that you're interested in. We can always uh, take questions. Um, this is, and first of all, I need to acknowledge my friend and colleague, Paul Messina, who was the first director of ECP, and he and I were here in 2016. And at that time, reflecting back, uh, back on it, we were just starting this project. We became a formal project in DOE since uh, July 2016, which means we passed critical mission need. And we didn't start uh, engaging teams and funding them until um, fall 16. So um, what I'm going to try to do here in the next uh, few minutes is show you some results for some of the, what the teams are doing uh, kind of the past year and a half. And this is normally a seven-year project, so um, this is a good time to to kind of do a stock take on where we are, where we're headed, and get your all's feedback on what we need to be doing differently. Yes, let's, let's see. Yes, okay. So this, uh, the ECP, Exascale Computing Project, is part, is part of a U.S. Department of Energy initiative. Okay, we need to get a different, different uh, okay. In any case, I'm going to keep talking. Um, the Department of Energy, funds this, this uh, project in two ways. The Office of Science um, is a large contributor, and specifically the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office. And uh, the Advanced, that's better, isn't it? The, uh, the Advanced Simulation and Computing Program, which is in the National Nuclear Security Administration. So um, ECP is funded uh, across kind of uh, two programs. That said, there is an initiative across the Department of Energy known as the Exascale Computing Initiative, ECI, and it's a crosscut. Uh, that really kind of crosses through all the programs in the Department of Energy. And ECP is a subset of that. So it's important to point out what ECP's scope is, which is delivering application software and, um, and funding U.S. vendors, uh, hardware vendors for R&D. But ECI, the, uh, when you um, add some dollars on top of EC ECP, you get ECI. And ECI is the procurement activities for the Exascale system. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the systems we're targeting, they're outside of the scope of this project, but we're intimately, uh, you know, codependent. So we have a shared fate, really, with, with our, uh, our facility partners. Oops, I keep forgetting. Okay, going the wrong way. So let's talk about exascale systems. So um, really an exciting time for our uh, systems here in, in uh, the Department of Energy. There are 17 labs in the Department of Energy, and I'm at one of them, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, six national labs have historically deployed HPC systems and engaged in, in large HPC uh, research. And so we, we'll, we'll call these our, uh, uh, we tend to call them the facilities. But it's uh, on the NNSA side, it's Los Alamos, Livermore, Sandia, and then the Office of Science, it's Oak Ridge, Berkeley, and Argonne. And so what you see here is basically a notional, it's uh, in some cases notional, some cases not, timeline for system deployments at the data centers at uh, these various DOE labs. I currently sit, I, I sit at Oak Ridge, and Summit is a, is a great system coming online now. It's going through acceptance, um, has order 25,000 voltas, uh, basically a node is two, two IBM power nines and six voltas. And um, early, uh, early returns are the system rocks. I mean, we're getting great returns on our applications. So ECP, the point is, is we're not gonna wait till the exascale systems are our plan. So Argon A21, uh, Frontier at Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge and El Capitan at Livermore. That's kind of the first wave. And uh, the, the systems are to be determined because there hasn't been an RFP issued, there hasn't been uh, responses, there hasn't been contract signed. So until all that stuff happens, uh, we're not going to know exact dates and details. Um, that, that should be coming, coming soon within the next year, uh, probably uh, sooner than that. Oops. I have a problem with my keychain, so I apologize. Um, so uh, we're gonna. So the, the the Sierra system also at Livermore is very similar to Summit, so they're both going through acceptance. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna learn what Nurse the Nurse Nine system is about soon, and uh, the Lano Crossroad system not not long after that. The point is, is ECP is going to be deploying. We have been our applications and software stack on the pre exascale systems. We have very specific met targets and metrics for the exascale systems, and so you can see. 
that um, uh, kind of in the 2021 to 2023 timeframes when those systems are deployed and ECP nominally will wrap up and hopefully succeed as a project in 2022. So basically um, deliver the, the initial set of technologies that we think will, uh, we expect will be enduring for, for decades to come. Oops. Okay. So let me, let me take you back. When I first went to Los Alamos in 1984, I got to get on a uh, XMP24. This was a brochure when I was there as a student. Does anybody know what the two and the four means? <laughs> you do. There you go. Uh, two CPUs, um, each at 100 megaflops, so uh, 200 megaflop. Actually, it was 200 megaflops, 400, 400 megaflops total, and four megawords, 32 megabytes. I got, a, I got an iPhone X, so I'm, I, I don't really need it. It's got way too much power, but uh, it is 75 times, uh, 75 times faster than that system. And um, it's, a, you know, it's about 20,000 times cheaper. So the point is, is you know, we're really lucky in this field of computational science and industry to really just ride this wonderful uh, curve, so to speak, of hardware technology. Um, with ECP, there's a lot of very exciting things coming, but we need to do a better job in being ready. We just can't ride that Moore's Law curve. Um, just to show you, I've done a little bit in your space. Um, I worked on a multi-phase flow code back in the late 80s called CFD Lib and, and learned my first, had my first sort of foyer into uh, uh, FCCs. Really complicated problem. We were excited that we could do maybe, you know, six or seven zones azimuthally for an FCC. Uh, you know, now looking back on it, I, I wouldn't have believed anything that came out of that calculation, but we enjoyed working with Exxon a lot, and so I, I do um, have a, a little more than, I guess, uh, appreciation for how complicated uh, your situation's on. I guess you would call this kind of the, the uh, um, one of the more difficult sides of, uh, of the simulation um, aspects, but we did work closely with Exxon for a couple years and a great, a great experience. Um, then my first parallel experience was a connection machine, and here's another kind of brochure from uh, my time there, and I got to, to, to port a code from the Cray, and it really wasn't port, you just rewrite from scratch um, to, to the CM200 at the time and then the CM5. Uh, just a wonderful machine in, in my view. Um, ironically, thinking machines uh, was one of their, their sort of mottos, or at think.com, and I think we're starting to see that with, with AI. Um, but this is really a kind of a segue into, well, let's look at the V100. Um, this thing is 57 times faster than that uh, CM5 uh, that I worked on. Uh, CM5 is about 135 gigaflops. So you see the numbers here, and there are order 26,000 of these on the Summit system. And so, you know, if you look, if you look at these, there are over 27,000, excuse me. Um, so you look at the 64-bit performance, um, seven and a half uh, teraflops, 15, 32, but 16 screens. So the uh, AI, market is really driving the development of this hardware. And so, um, you know, our view on the application side is uh, we have to figure out how to, how to use, use this hardware and exploit it the best we can. We also want to bring in data science and data analytics as part of our workflow. But um, this is a, a, just a, a beast of a system. In fact, um, in terms of 16-bit uh, operations, it's a three exa-op system. So it will be a machine learning beast. But the point is, is for more, some of our more traditional mod sim apps, a lot of which are in, in, uh, represented in this group, we need to figure out uh, where we can how to cheat and, and, take, uh, and take advantage of this reduced uh, precision, these fused multiply ads that are really just going to scream on, on accelerators like this and also accelerators we're going to see um, in the coming years. So let me go back to ECP, ECP and I mentioned it's, it's, a, it's a broader part, it's a part of the broader uh, ECI strategy. And so again, um, ECI is not just ECP, which is app software and, uh, and vendor hardware R&D, but it's procurement of systems. So the way I like to think about our reason for existence is deliver exascale ready apps poised to solve problems for the nation. Um, we're not gonna claim we're gonna solve them all, but we wanna have technology and applications that can address them. Uh, create and deploy a software stack, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that later, that um, supports those applications. Um, and um, really, invest heavily um, in U.S. vendor uh, hardware and hardware R&D, both node-based and system-based. And this investment now, uh, we believe, and, we're, and we think we're seeing it, will inform um, better responses uh, from the U.S. vendors for our XXL uh, procurement calls. And in a sense, we want to see products pulled in quicker and pro products pulled down uh, uh, sooner so that we can take advantage of them for our needs. 
Oops. So ECP, as we mentioned uh, two years ago, is really broken into three technical focus areas, um, application development, software technology, and hardware integration. And I'll mention that we have our two leads of the application uh, um, development area here, uh, Eric Siegel, uh, I'm sorry, Andrew Siegel from Argonne and Eric Drager from Livermore. And I, I think I see uh, Andrew in the back and there's Eric there. Andrew will be talking later and being on a panel and I think they're here today and tomorrow. So feel free to, to uh, engage in them um, in terms of details of what we're doing and how. I'm, I'm gonna try to hit um, mostly applications because I, I thought that's where the interest might, might be um, and some on software technology. The hardware and integration area, really a key element is, is our Path Forward program, which is the program that funds the six uh, uh, US um, um, vendors, if I can get them right here. We have uh, NVIDIA, IBM, Intel, AMD, uh, um, HPE, and Cray are the six vendors that are supported uh, in this program. So let me move on applications. And basically, uh, a couple of key points to make. Um, we don't have the, the funding or the time to really do wholesale redesign restructure of applications. We have a large legacy code base that's very important for us. Uh, a substantial fra uh, fra a fraction of it is Fortran that are used daily to deliver answers to inform uh, key decisions. So we want targeted development, surgical development of, uh, of the models, methods, and algorithms where we think we need to, to really address an issue, uh, performance issue or whatever, we'll do that. But also every application, and there are 32 sub-projects in this area, has a unique development plan that targets a specific challenge problem. That development plan might, might be mostly software oriented. It might be mostly uh, computer science, I'm sorry, uh, applied math. It, it might be uh, physics, um, you know, injection of new and better physics models. Most of the uh, development plans really are kind of a, a unique mix of, of all three. So, if you, if you put our, the ECP applications now, and they were selected a, a little over a year and a half, and they've been executing now for about that long, um, and these are small teams of, of, uh, of scientists, and they are led by domain scientists at a national lab. Each team typically consists of university people, in some cases industry people, and we do recognize we need to, we need to, to tap more into this community as well as the industry community. The, the applications that I put in bold, I think kind of have probable overlap with, with your scope and requirements. This is Doug kind of taking a wag. Um, and so we put them in these various uh, uh, bins. Um, what you see for the title is not the, you know, not the code name or the project name, but really the problem that they're addressing, the problem that, that we're trying to solve. So in ECP, the mission scope is very broad. We have national security. Uh, we have our energy offices and energy security. Uh, DOE, um, su not surprisingly, or maybe surprisingly, does a lot of work that directly influences our uh, uh, economic competitiveness. Uh, we have fundamental science applications, uh, earth system applications, and one key one that's our kind of a flagship machine learning app is our cancer moonshot app application known as Candle, a cancer uh, environment, distributed learning environment where we're using uh, machine learning uh, to uh, target precision medicine for oncology. I don't plan to talk a lot about Candle. Maybe we can, we can uh, converse a little bit more about that later, but we do expect that project to emit a more general machine learning environment that's just not uh, solely tuned for, for cancer. This is an eye chart, um, and I'll just leave this behind, but the point is, um, what are we trying to do at Exascale? Well, we're trying to uh, not just address key national problems, um, but each problem has a specific uncertainty associated with it with regard to confidence in our application. And so um, each application is targeting a, a particular problem, but also trying to knock down uncertainty so we can increase our confidence. Uh, you know, I like the NRC's 95-95 rule, um, being a nuclear engineer, which is 95% confident you're gonna hit 95% of the data. So that's a, a nice statistical definition, and I'm not claiming we're there, but each one of our applications has different kind of air bars, uh, better physics models, better fidelity, and so each bullet here uh, sort of represents one application and um, what's the impact if we don't address that. In many cases, it's conservatism remains in our design choices, uh, extended periods between concept to decision, higher cost. Um, so all these things, I think, drive our, uh, our, our development activities just like they th I, I think they do your industry. So in terms of application metrics, um, these are sometimes competing and there's, there's tension, okay? So we want to be able to take uh, advantage of the system. And um, when, when we use the term performance, it's just not percent of peak flops or 
percent of some system metric, it's performance on a real science problem. Um, performance is not just faster simulation, but uh, better physics, more enriched physics. So I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to measure that um, in ECP. Uh, portability is often at odds, at odds with performance. So, um, but we don't want um, boutique one-off applications and only execute on one, on one architecture. That would be a waste of taxpayer dollars. So we want to make sure that what we do has a line of sight or has a, has a life uh, beyond ECP. The app needs to be ready, and we're defining readiness for applications. Um, Eric and Andrew are working on that. We want an application to be able to roll on and run on the system when it's deployed at the design scale. The design scale for an app might be 10% of the system, it might be the full system, it might be ensembles, but we want to be ready when we want a real problem, get the right answer. Okay, so each application has very specific readiness and performance metrics. Um, we do think we want to take advantage of modern software technologies and all this to find modern meaning. Um, somebody writes a compiler for the language I'm choosing beyond ECP. You know, I want to have something. I want to use something that's kind of more mainstream and uh, you know has a good vector in the in the, in the future. And obviously, being strategic, which is high priority. So um, our application development efforts aren't just developing general capabilities. We expect the development efforts to be general, but each one, like I said, has a specific challenge problem that we've negotiated uh, with the program offices. A, a problem that's of strategic importance. Uh, it has a solution we think that's amenable to mod sim and currently cannot, is intractable uh, on today's systems. And that does not mean that every application needs to scale up and weak scale to the whole system. Uh, we have some where ensembles, whether you, know, you're, you want to do it a, a UQ analysis or statistical analysis, we have some applications where ensembles of simulations with high throughput are, uh, uh, we view, a, a, a good use of the system. Let's see. Okay. So um, on a challenge problem, just how are we kind of measuring performance? Well, it isn't, like I said, percent of some system metric. It's being able to do um, n times, in this case I've, I've noted it, uh, n times more work on um, the systems today relative to exascale. And our target is 50, a kind of an average sense for our, our application suite. And here work is work rate. So it's a rate of doing science, a rate of doing engineering. Uh, so it's not just turnaround time. It's really and so think of W as uh, science, um, physics, operations related to better physics, better models, and of course time is throughput. Um, most of the applications are adding more physics, adding, adding better models, so the work rate, the work's going up, and the time may stay constant, and that's still, that's still fine because the work rate goes up. So we're really working hard to define our work rate, uh, you know, have it, make sure it has a line of sight to, to better science. Example are Monte Carlo simulation, uh, number of particles per second is a reasonable measure of fidelity. Um, you know, for grid-based systems, it's you know, number of cells per cycle per time. So in other words, we have normalized kind of work rates. So every application is working to a very specific challenge problem and a specific uh, work rate. So in terms of applications, some thoughts. So a lot of our applications have an applied engineering focus. A lot of CFD work goes on in ECP. And so I'm just sort of listing a few, uh, well, a lot of different algorithms and models we have a lot of structural mechanics work going on in phase change heat transfer. So on the engineering side, you know, you might see we have a cosmology application, but we, if you sit down and talk to us, we're using particle and cell, or we're using smooth particle hydrodynamics for shock physics, or, or we might have a, uh, a wind energy application that isn't in your space, but they're using very scalable CFD, you know, high-end, you know, sort of modern turbulence models, LES, DES, with uh, FSI, fluid structure interaction. So there's a lot of our apps that if you kind of double click down, you'll see, I, I, I hope, or at least, um, um, yeah, I do hope that um, it'll be of interest to this community. We're really invested and heavily focused on motif-based co-design. What we've chosen to do is to focus on motifs as a way to get better performance um, on current and coming systems. And I'll say a little bit more about motifs, but basically they are common methods of communication and computation that are surprisingly uh, there for most of our applications in, in sort of small numbers. Um, examples are unstructured meshes. There, there's, a, there's always a set of uh, indirect addressing uh, operations we go through. Uh, you might use finite element or finite volume, but we're focusing on making that particular uh, motif scream on systems, um, in this case with co-design, uh, is the right thing to do. We think it has a good cross-cut high impact. Uh, structured meshes, particles, workflow, FFT, graph analytics, these are examples. We have centers kind of focused around these motifs. And usually it's not one, but kind of a collection of motifs. 
We are about coupled multi-physics. Um, a lot of our applications are already executing multi-physics, but not well or not well enough, or they want to add more physics and do uh, work on tighter coupling. That's a, that's a key kind of uh, theme for, for a lot of the applications. And again, like I said, a lot of the non-oil and gas apps will likely have something to offer, and I list some, some examples there. Um, Andrew will talk about this more, um, programming the, the nodes, but you see just on Summit, you have tremendous concurrency local. Okay, so we don't, we're not concerned as much about scaling out, um, but scaling in. We have a lot more concurrency local, which means if you use MPI everywhere, both local and node to node, and we're all in on MPI, but you really have to have another model locally, whether it's OpenMP, OpenACC, uh, CUDA, QThreads, whatever. Um, there's no clear winner at this point, but you really need to embrace the concurrency local. And like I said, we're doing more than dabbling in AI. So, um, Application motifs really harken back to Phil Colella. Uh, he first came up with what he called the seven dwarfs. We call them the seven motifs now. And then there's six more for data science. So what we did is we took a look, look at our applications and uh, the classical motifs, I'll call them, are on the left-hand side. And a lot of our mod sim applications um, typically use two or three of these at, at least. And so we decided that we needed to focus on co-design activities here and try to make these, these motifs scream and the co-design centers could give best practices, lessons learned to the apps and say, here's how you ought to lay out your data if you're going to push particles. That's kind of the minimum entry. But uh, we really want them to actually deploy uh, next generation libraries, motif-based libraries that the applications use. And that's going to be hard because in the case of particles, they're sort of in, you know, just immersed all throughout your code and your data structure. So we're really trying to, there's really a tension here, I guess, between an application developer and, and co-design. And, and in some cases, um, uh, you know, there, there are some great successes already that's showing this is working. In other cases, I, I think it, uh, it's clear we have more work to do. So again, this just kind of uh, summarizes what I just stated. Now I'm going to show you some examples. So one co-design center is patch-based AMR led by John Bell at Berkeley, Berkeley and his center he calls AMRX. Uh, he's already released his infrastructure. And uh, AMRX, and I'm, you know, again, I'm going, to, I'm going to move quickly through some examples, um, isn't just patch-based AMR. Uh, with, tile, with tiling um, on each patch to get good performance locally. But he's also got particles push, uh, particle pusher and embedded boundaries. And so um, he's also, uh, so there you kind of see his overall, overall infrastructure. Also already got it integrated into five ECP applications. Um, and what's neat about AMRX is you can, you can have it kind of own you. It's sort of the environment you live in or it can be kind of a library call or a subroutine call, whatever you want to call it. In other words, you can kind of just negotiate with this package whether you want it to be the boss or you're the boss and you use certain pieces. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not going to, with AMRX, uh, push the code out everywhere, but we have enough experience with it. This is already looking to be a tremendous success with, I think, a, a kind of a class of applications that um, you know, this group would be interested in. John and his team are doing a great job and um, this is for, again, patch-based structured mesh uh, AMR. And the other one is unstructured mesh uh, PDEs. So here we're talking about high order finite element discretization on unstructured meshes. So you've got unstructured mesh data flow and indirect addressing. And the, uh, the Livermore crowd, this is Ani Okolev and Lawrence Livermore, have really embraced the fact that we're going to have lots of, of flops um, virtually free and right next to us. Why wouldn't we want to try to go high order Okay, because we can get all that, those extra uh, computations almost for, for, for free. We can up our CI, computational intensity. And if we go higher, we might be able to use less mesh because guess what? Next generation systems aren't gonna use a lot of, aren't gonna have a lot of memory. So I wanna try to, try to be as memory efficient as I can and go high order. And so we believe uh, high order discretizations on unstructured meshes or just in general is a good, is a good approach. So again, he's focused on PD-based PD simulations on unstructured meshes and you can see some examples of early successes he's had with, with uh, codes at, uh, at Livermore. And one of his key libraries that's coming out of it is called MFIM, which, which is uh, an open library. And so again, uh, this, this uh, center has been executing for about a year and a half and um, integrated into a couple of codes um, and also uh, has, has a release. And so this is the kind of thing we want to do is push products out. We like to see people like, like this crowd test them and give us feedback. Um, Zanio and his team um, are, are looking at a lot of unstructured mesh applications. And you see things you would never guess uh, involve unstructured PDEs like urban systems. Well, uh, we want to use unstructured mesh CFD for flow around buildings. Uh, additive manufacturing. 
you have structural aspects, residual stress, strain. Like I said, when you've got CFD and structural. And so he can, he can hit a lot of domains um, if, if he designs his software right, right. And I'm not saying you can black box this stuff. It's not plug and play. But um, this kind of uh, technology, having a team focus on one, ass one motif, we think is going to give us payoff. Particles are ubiquitous in our applications. COPA is led by Tim, Ger Tim German at uh, uh, Los Alamos. It's also a center that's focused on particles. And this is, a tougher, this is a tougher one because having a particle push library or a particle mesh, mesh mapping library is going to be tougher to kind of integrate in um, to a lot of applications because that, that sort of data structure is really infused. Nevertheless, um, they've had some early, early successes um, focusing more on molecular dynamics, um, but, but we'll be uh, then moving to PIC and, uh, and uh, something called MPM uh, next. Let me move now into some applications. Um, Carl Stiefel is here, and he is PI. Where's Carl? He was smart. He probably didn't step in. There you are. Hey, Carl. So talk to this guy about uh, subsurface. Carl has a, a way cool application that's right in your space. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to go quickly, but let me just point out. Uh, let me see. So he, here you see his challenge problem. But basically, it's uh, if I go back, um, you know, a reservoir level uh, capability f for non-isothermal multi-phase fluid flow, Darcy, reactive transport. Uh, he's, he's got mul multiple DOE uh, program offices that are interested in this. So it's, it's geothermal, uh, nuclear waste deposit, uh, obviously carbon sequestration. Um, very complicated problem as this community would, would agree with. But what I really like about it, and this is just very typical for a lot of our applications, is you have two different codes that are going to be coming together. GEOS is a, is a uh, Lagrangian more thermomechanic uh, uh, code from, uh, from Lawrence Livermore, and Chombo Crunch, which is a structured mesh, pass-based AMR uh, code from Berkeley. And basically, you're going to pass this interface back and forth, and Chombo is going to, to take the interface geometry and do the advective transport and then GEOS will pro further crack, uh, propagate the cracks. Um, and so this is a, a good example of, a, of you know, it, uh, it's an exascale problem to get these two codes working together, but also there's a lot of very important physics going on and algorithms to couple these codes together. We also have a, a combustion science one. This is, I think, in your space as well, Jackie Chin at Sandia. Um, the interesting thing about this application, it's hybrid, uh, really DNS and LES and bringing it together and her code suite, this is uh, targeting the RCCI, internal combustion engine, but also land-based uh, turbines. And her code suite she calls Pele, because she's a soccer fan, her kids played soccer. But she has a Pele C and a Pele LM. Pele C is compressible, fully compressible, more DNS. It's going to be around the, the flame front. Uh, we're gonna use, she's going to use DNS. And then the LES, more low Mach number, away from the flame front. She's going to marry, marry two codes together, Pele LM and Pele C. And guess what? She's brought in AMRX. So that gives her, uh, almost from the start, a fundamental kind of underpinning and adaptive mesh refinement. And the thing that really impressed me, so first of all, you know, we can follow the flame front very well now. So you can see an example of how the patch-based AMR works in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, but then we can also, uh, this embedded boundary capability is really coming along in, in AMRX. In other words, you have the approach to, to, to discretize some um, complicated geometries with unstructured meshes is being tried and true and, and arguably maybe the most accurate. But here you have, with structured meshes, the ability to, uh, to do cut cells and embed boundaries and, and very quickly sleuth out complicated geometries. And if you work hard in getting those embedded boundaries uh, fairly accurate and you don't lose order and whatnot, you can do, uh, you can do a fair amount with, uh, with this and it'll perform, likely perform a lot better. So I'm not saying this uh, replaces the unstructured mesh approach, but it really is a nice augmentation. So here you see she's able to, with the cut cells, uh, really do a, co a combustor geometry, uh, you know, right, off, um, right from the get-go with, with AMRX. You, can't see, you probably can't see the plots, but one interesting thing about this code, too, she's, she's got a kind of a version that's, uh, a version that's been written in, in Legion or, or per certain parts of it that uses uh, task-based runtime systems. And uh, you see the performance improvement she's getting with task-based runtime systems. And we're really kind of at the cusp right now trying to understand what works, what doesn't, what programming model should we use or not use. And Andrew, I think, we'll, we'll talk about that more. But early returns, and we're not saying we're all in on Legion. We think it's actually a really, really nice environment, and um, we're exploring it fairly seriously. Um, but she's got some nice early returns that shows a task-based runtime system, or at least in part on Node, 
can, can, does have the potential of giving you better performance. There are other alternatives too, like Parsec and HPX, et cetera. But this is a good example of the kinds of things we're, we're doing. Another application area is multi-phase flow. And uh, NETL, uh, Madhava Shamlal at uh, NETL has, has been really kind of a, a key person with a multi-phase flow code known as MFIX for a couple of decades. Um, when we brought them into Exascale, we partnered them with Berkeley and um, brought in AMRX as underpinning, uh, modernized the numerics, and um, the target now that MFIX EXA has, which is a chemical looping reactor in kind of two fluidized beds, really looks within reach. Um, in this case, um, he's targeting scaling up of a chemical looping reactor. You can see uh, 2017 specific particle counts, and, and this is DEM, discrete element model. I didn't mention that. Um, and so, the, you know, the target is, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, one megawatt system. He's shooting for at least a billion, uh, maybe a couple hundred billion particles with DEM. And um, using, uh, using AMRX, because AMRX has a, has a particle pusher in it as well, has been able to kind of overlay his multi-phase flow algorithms uh, with AMRX underpinning and right now kind of targeting various aspects of the, of the, the chemical looping reactor, making sure that you can do settling beds and, and uh, fluidized beds well. But you see there on the, on the right, simple, simple test problems that are still way cool in my view are really, are really uh, uh, looking good for this code that's really been kind of overhauled and sort of uh, adopted the approach that I'm gonna live within the AMRX environment. Um, so my multi-phase flow, uh, flow code is gonna be kind of subsumed. Andrew's gonna talk about challenges on applications. I, I think there's a lot of challenges ahead. We have not got all this figured out. There's a lot, lot of work to do, and we think there's still a lot of risks. Uh, billion-way concurrency, I think, is a key thing with, with applications. Um, but Andrew, in his talk later, will talk, we'll dive into this more in detail. I wanna say a little bit about our software now, which is the software technology area. This is led by Mike Aru at Sandy and Jonathan Carter at Berkeley. They're both not here. Uh, so I won't do justice to it. But we have a large number of uh, sub-projects that are um, executing to deliver uh, essentially what we'll call a, a software stack for ECP. Now, first of all, the vendors come in with a fairly good, mature stack. So we're not claiming we're gonna write a new, app, new OS. We're gonna partner with the vendors to make sure what we're doing uh, is in sync with what they're doing. And we, let, we basically layer on top of the OS. Many of, some aspects of what we need, the vendors have been working, working on for years. Um, what we're doing is partnering with them to make sure that the Exascale versions of these are, are ready to go. So this is kind of a, kind of a high-level view of, of the stop, software stack from, from Mike Carew's point of view and his team. The key thing I want to leave you with is um, he's really pushed, Mike's really pushed, and we're all in on this, the idea of software development kits. We're going to break up our stack into various pieces called SDK. We're going to containerize them. We're going to put them out there so people can pull them down especially our facilities and, uh, and vendors. Um, but they're, the common theme is uh, they're, they're kind of circled around a common set of functionalities. An example is a math SDK, which are linear and nonlinear, sparse and dense solvers, eigensolvers, et cetera. Um, the idea of packaging them all, all up um, has a lot of attractive features. There's just simple inconsistencies you found where a lot of these libraries are using different .h files, as, as an example. I want to make sure they build together and build consistently. Also plan to push this up to open sites like, say, OpenHPC, where we can share more, uh, more intimately with the vendors. Um, an example is the Math XDK, uh, I'm sorry, Math SDK that uh, was formerly called XSDK. And you can look up in the right-hand quadrant there. You see maybe some standard solvers that, you, that you've used, with Petsy, SuperLU, Trilinos, Hyper. Uh, we'll bring in Jack Dongera's Magma. And MFIM actually is a... Is a um, uh, finite element uh, library, as I mentioned before. Sundials is an ODE library. So from an app's point of view, it's nice to have one, uh, one package that I bring in, and you know, at runtime, I might be able to switch and mix and match and, and try different solvers without having to go through a lot of pain myself to build. Now, it doesn't mean we're gonna say you can only use these libraries through the math SDK. You can always use just single, single libraries, but we think this is a nice way to package and, uh, and deploy. Mike's area has a lot going on, not just math libraries. I'm not gonna be able to hit this, but development tools, programming models and runtimes. Andrew will talk more about that, the various options that we're testing. Um, you know, it's sort of all of the above at this point. Data is really important and uh, software ecosystem and delivery really has to do with packaging those SDKs and getting them to facilities. So as we look at the stack, okay, 
Programming models and runtimes, I list some of the things that, uh, that are, we're currently engaged in. Development tools, math libs, data and viz, software ecosystem and delivery. Um, we, we also believe that we can help drive new programming model standards. We have a lot of our folks on standards committees like OpenMP and C++ as an example. Where some of the things that we're doing like uh, Cocos at Sandia, Raja at Livermore to deal with the memory and, uh, and compute hierarchies, um, we'd like to see them or some parts of them migrate into the standard. So, um, you know, now's the chance to sit down with us and see if you think this approach makes sense and, and help us, if so, um, you know, make some of this happen. Again, software challenges, as Mike writes, billion way concurrency, the coupled applications, uh, data driven, and making sure that what we do is really part of a, a sustainable ecosystem. In the end, for us to succeed, we have to push our products to facilities. And the hardware and integration areas led by Terry Quinn at Loris Livermore is really responsible for making sure this stuff is deployed at facilities because our facilities, at least at Oak Ridge, will not take uh, you know, a new library that, that I can just say module load uh, foo.ecp uh, without it going through extensive testing. Don't, we can't break the system. We have to make sure we have support. So one, one kind of unique aspect of ECP is not R&D, but the D part, the deployment. And so we're really serious about this and, and we're funding efforts to, to push, to do this kind of regular push to uh, facilities. I think I'll, I'll skip this one. I'm gonna uh, conclude with some comments about AI and uh, data analytic computing. So if you look at the National Strategic Computing Initiative plan, which we still um, are, um, are marching according to, um, there's, there's nice words in there about uh, data analytic computing or DAC and, and mod sim. And basically what you see is the AI community, I'll just call it AI, uh, is really demanding increased computational intensity and, and, and facing barriers of scalability. And the machine learning itself is beginning to look at what physics should I use to constrain my choices, often called scientific machine learning, or Los Alamos calls it physics informed machine, machine learning. So you see the, D, the, you know, the DAC area kind of needing to move a little bit into mod sim area. In other words, there's some, there some areas where we can help each other out. And uh, the mod sim area is really demanding more intimate interaction with the data, online data analysis reduction. I'll give some examples of how we kind of see that uh, in ECP. And in the end, you know, uh, the challenge is what, what software layers make the most sense for this merge? Um, and on the application side, our view is, at least my own view, is applications need to roll on to whatever hardware and they say, okay, I've seen this before. Um, I think I know how to lay out my data and use it most effectively, rather than just saying I can only run on this one uh, piece of hardware. So hardware tuned for AI, uh, we're, we need to learn how to use and exploit for more traditional mod sim. So example of how uh, exascale applications really bring some of these two together, mod sim and AI. On the left, I listed what I call in situ analytics. And so in the italicized parentheses are, are the actual application. And this is kind of where we see these things coming together. Cross-session processing, um, historically in reactor simulation, these are large data tables that I pull in. I can instead use data fits or fits for machine learning so I don't have to store all that. In this case, we're using multipole expansion. Um, combustion, I need to try to do threshold feature detection to understand what's turbulent and what's not. Where's the flame, where, where is it not? Same with climate, looking for uh, vortical features in the ocean and in the atmosphere. And uh, turbulent, turbulent uh, um, entities in, uh, in uh, um, tokamak reactors. So you see some common themes here about feature detection and whatnot that really is a kind of a poster child for, for offloading that to, to some AI uh, frameworks. And one that I really like is, is actually using machine learning to, uh, to computationally steer simulations. Lawrence Livermore is having good luck right now when, uh, with their uh, AL calculations, in other words, moving mesh, uh, trying to use a machine learning approach to deduce quality of the mesh and steer the, out, steer the code rather than have a human have to uh, do a restart dump, fix the mesh, and go on. So there's an example of computational steering. Same way with, with molecular dynamics. That's going on in our precision medicine uh, effort where ML can be used to, to steer MD simulations. And uh, probably the one that's most natural for the, for the physicists in us is modeling unresolved physics. Um, uh, there's been a lot of work, actually more at universities and national labs for um, doing on the fly, uh, it's called, I, I think the groups call it a, autonomous turbulent modeling, on the fly per, uh, parameter fitting for LES for, for various uh, subgrid models. Same is, at least there's a potential for subgrid cloud resolving models in climate. So here you see um, subgrid models, some of the, the more automatable things could be, could be done 
uh, with machine learning. But the only kind of the flagship predictive analytics app we have is Precision Medicine for Cancer. And here this environment known, known as Candle, or, uh, Rick Stevens at Argonne leads it, has taken a very pragmatic approach, which is saying there are good industry frameworks out there like Tensor, Tiano, Torch Cafe, T uh, TensorFlow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them in one environment and have them interoperate and then uh, see how well those industry frameworks can do for my problem. And if I need to do more model parallelism, which is a challenge as opposed to data parallelism, then maybe I have to dive in deep and see what I can do with those frameworks. And if not, I may have to roll my own. So it's a very pragmatic approach to, to ride the, the industry framework course as much as we can before we go off and, and just roll, roll our own machine learning environment. A couple labs have started this on their own internal fundings, really focused at model parallelism. Uh, we'll kind of see, see how that goes. Uh, the super facility concept is really marrying experimental data. We have billion dollar experimental facilities in the DOE uh, with computational data, ideally being able to do real time uh, steering of the experiment itself. And in this case, we're focusing on uh, free electron laser generated light source called LCL L L LCLS at um, uh, SLAC. And um, ideally, instead of having to wait hours or days to understand what we saw and then go back, is to computationally steer. It's a real heavy lift, and that's kind of a different beast relative to what we're used to. There's a lot of workflow and uh, event-driven uh, issues to deal with, and actually Legion is, is proven to be a pretty good programming model for, for that approach. Um, we do have some graph analytics work going on. I mentioned we had a graph analytic co-design center, uh, but that's really underpinning for doing uh, DNA sequencing, uh, for doing power grid simulations, and, uh, and chemistry to understand reaction networks. So, um, there's a surprising amount of sort of graph analytics buried in, in what I would call um, a lot more uh, traditional mod sim uh, applications. So uh, last slide, um, we think, at least I do, think this is a really exciting time for computational science and that we have the opportunity to play a key role. I think we have a really, really fantastic group of people. Uh, you folks not, notwithstanding, we can always use more help and, uh, and input on what we're doing and why. Um, we, do, we do currently enjoy uh, great stakeholder support. We believe we're one of, we, we are one of DOE's highest priorities. And you know, we really think this is just a fantastic time and um, that's why I'm really happy to be here and share what we're doing and maybe more importantly what we're not doing and where we need your, need your help and input. So that said, uh, thanks for your time and attention. Appreciate it. I think we have room for a couple of questions. Yeah. Quiet crowd. So, so I guess this kind of stuff goes on in every country or every continent, like Europe. I mean, do you compete with them or do you cooperate with other countries or it, this is kind of national security thing or how, how, how do you look at that? No, we do. Um, you can still hear me. So uh, just last week I, I was in France and we were talking to the Europeans about their effort and the Japanese about their effort. Um, you know, I think on, on the software side and, and even some on the application side, there's a lot of, there's a lot of collaboration. Um, we're kind of exchanging uh, best practices and lessons learned. So we can't solve this easily on our own, that's for sure. Additional questions? So uh, in your talk, you mentioned C++, Fortran, languages that are paying attention to, and you have people on the commissions. And uh, any any people paying attention to Python, given the AI and machine learning yeah. becoming a big deal, and everybody there uses Python. So is that some of concern, or actually, it's an oversight. Python is used in virtually every project. Okay. I will say that um, Mike Carew and his folks are, are, uh, are experimenting with Julia. Julia is a very interesting language. Um, they're looking at kind of a rewrite of us, one of his components to, to get some experience there. You know, in the, in the AI community, uh, in analytics community, Scala and Lua are also, you know, heavily used. We haven't gone that direction so much, but Python, yeah, I should have mentioned it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's, a, it's a great language in my view. So. Good role. This is a good role. So uh, is there any approach on using HPC, leveraging the capability of spinning up to run uh, different AI, like deep learning, hyperparameter tuning? 
And if there is, could you explain, like, say, how the structure of the performance or the expectations for that effort and direction? Okay, so if I understood your question, is there any, in, any efforts in ECP on hyperparameter tuning? Um, yes, not, um, perhaps not large enough. Um, for example, on the Summit system now, we are looking at, uh, you know, how to, how to better optimize hyperparameters. Right now, it's not a solved problem, okay? But what, what we are seeing, and I'm, I'm gonna defer I, maybe to Rick Stevens, but in talking to Rick, is a human constructed uh, network that's very structured, uh, may not be the best fit uh, for uh, a large system. In other words, the, the structure of the network might, better, might be better to match the topology of the network. Uh, but that's, a, that's an area we need to spend more time on. So. Uh, one more question, we'll take the last one there. Great, great presentation, thank you. Thank you. Uh, how, how do we get engaged? Good, good, good question. Um, this morning at a workshop, I had a slide on that. I, I, uh, I should, should probably pull it up. Excuse me, my looks my, like my. Um, so first of all, a lot of our work is open, okay? We're, we're putting a lot of our work um, out in open source. Um, we have a website where uh, we're gonna do better in, in putting information as to who the PIs are, what they're doing, who's on the team. Um, we're, we actually have a nice set of um, uh, Let's Talk Exascale, their podcasts where you know, the PIs are talking about what they're doing and there's fairly detailed write-ups. Um, we, uh, we give a lot of presentations like this. Um, I think we can do a better job in, in, in uh, getting the word out. It may be that in the future there's kind of a window, maybe on GitHub, an ECP window where you can go in there and then go down and see uh, where all of our software is. Um, not surprisingly, uh, some of it we, you know, we won't release, but um, basically, if you, know, if you know who we are, and that's why we're here, I encourage you to, if not ping me, if you see you know, Carl Stiefel's a PI, he's leading a team, is to just, uh, just contact the PIs directly. Um, we have not done a good job in reaching out to industry, so we need, we need, to, need to do better. Um, you know, I wish I had a better answer. It's kind of a hodgepodge of things, but... Uh, I think I'd like to add, yeah. there's two answers sitting over here. Oh, yes. Susie and David. Yes. You know, they're going to be here today and tomorrow. Yes. So of two course. people over here, absolutely engage with them. So let's join me in thanking Doug. So. Yeah.